And it's really quite simple when you strip everything back. I think people get overwhelmed and, you know, conflicted because there's so much conflicting information online and everything else. And it really is quite simple, you know, if this was tried and tested because my girlfriend did it as well. And she was just like dropping weight, just getting leaner and leaner and leaner, just as a side effect. She was trying to eat more and more. She was loving it. She was loving the, enjoying the food, not getting bored, getting leaner and leaner and leaner, you know, non-essentially. Mm-hmm. And she built muscle as well, actually. And she's been training for a long time. Wake up feeling sharper in the mornings. You know, you're not getting as many cravings. Naturally, your body starts looking better when you look in the mirror because that's just a reflection of your habits, like I said. And it doesn't have to be so complicated. You know what I mean? It's like if people would just Hello, everyone. It's Dr. Anthony Chafee again here with another episode of The Plant Free MD. Today, I have a very special guest, Martin Silva, who is a transformation coach and ex-pro physique uh, competitor and public speaker and podcaster. He spent over, and he has over 15 years of experience in helping people unlock their true potential uh, with their mindset, body, and lifestyle. Martin, thank you so much for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me on, man. It's a pleasure to finally meet you. And I'm really looking forward to this chat, my man. Or well, even though we did just talk for an hour off air, you know what I mean? Hopefully we'll have something to talk about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, cool. Well, um, if you can tell us that for people who haven't come across you, uh, can you tell us a bit about you and what you do? Sure. Yeah. So long story short, I started off as a personal trainer when I was 19, 20, got into it from a really, really young age. And fast forward to now, I'm 35 years old. So I've been within the fitness space for you know 15 years or so now. And yeah, about three years ago, four years ago, I built like an online transformation program. So essentially I help people with everything in between now. So training, nutrition, lifestyle, mindset. And as you just said, then really helping people get into the shape of their life and unlock their true potential. Uh, but I've always been, you know, like yourself, you get, you could say an athlete, but never at the level of Anthony, you know what I'm saying? But I'm going to say athlete because it sounds good. <laughs> I used to play rugby uh, when I was younger up until I was about 25 and did bodybuilding then when I stopped playing rugby at about the age of 23, sorry, 24. And then I got into like competitive bodybuilding then about a year after that. And I did that for a good kind of three to five years, got to the pro level doing that in my twenties. And yeah, originally I'm from Wales in the UK. So I'm from uh, from Cardiff, the capital of Wales uh, in the UK. And I moved to Australia six years ago. So I've been here for exactly six years now and only came here, you know, the usual story, Anthony came here for a year as a Brit. And then the rest is history. Now I'm a permanent resident here and uh, yeah, moved to the other side of the world. So good times. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, so you, you, how long did you compete in in bodybuilding? So I did that for a good, I competed nine times. So I did it for like three years pretty consistently. And then I came to Australia and I packed it in. And then I just did one more show when I was in Oz then, which is 2019. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was three years, you know, pretty consistently. And then I did an extra one on top of that as well. Yeah. Nice. Very good. And you, you're also a podcaster. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I've got my own podcast, um, Optimize Your Body. Yeah. And yeah, I've been doing that for well, when I moved to Oz as well, actually, since 2018. Started it, uh, stopped it for a year and a half when I was uh, focusing on, you know, the online stuff and then picked it back up about a year and a half ago. Uh, had our 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 man, uh, Sean Baker, on the first episode and uh, kicked it off nice. to a flying start again. <laughs> yeah, great. And so what do you what do you like to talk about on uh, your podcast? What do you like to cover there? So on my podcast, I talk about uh, basically everything relating to um, sustainable health, if you like, sustainable health and, you know, fitness, nutrition, those kind of things. But what I do like to do, I like to keep it kind of diverse in terms of my guests, but, you know, I guess we'll talk about this. Um, I find myself getting more and more fascinated now about, you know, animal-based nutrition and stuff and the carnivore uh, way of living and stuff, because Obviously, we could talk about my transition, but generally, it's uh, it's everything relating to people getting into really, really good physical shape and really kind of building building a, a bulletproof body, if you like, and and helping them make changes with their mindset and lifestyle that they can actually stick to. So, my message is always about that sustainability. It's about making permanent changes because you know yourself. Most people really struggle to make changes that they can stick to because let's be honest, you know, behavior change doesn't matter who you are, don't care who you are. Uh, behavior changes is very difficult. You know what I mean? And uh, a lot of people are kind of all or nothing. And a lot of it, Anthony, to be honest, is based on my own personal experience as well, having been doing a body, uh, being a bodybuilder, got to the pro level doing that, as I said, you know, had the all or nothing mentality, basically. So I used to be world's worst for kind of, I was used to essentially binge as well for about, for about 18 months there on and off when I was bodybuilding because I kind of did it the wrong way on my first few shows. And I didn't really know what I was doing, just did it on a whim. 
and you know all the restrictive dieting, getting down to whatever it was, three, three, four percent body fat on the calibers. It's never going to be healthy. And uh, I actually ended up getting these poor behaviors and a poor relationship with food. And even a well, at that point, I'd even been training people as a as a personal trainer for about seven years. But even then, I actually developed like a, a worse relationship with exercise as well, where I would like absolutely just hammer my body in the gym to almost kind of like punish myself uh, for the, the some of the decisions I was making on the weekend with food and stuff. So everything that my clients have been through and that people that listen to my podcast, well, most things I've actually been through myself. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can actually relate to a lot of people as well. And I've managed to have my own transformation as well. And just basically in my twenties, I was always in shape physically, but I was, you know, partying for a big part of my twenties and just not taking care of myself, uh, internally for a period of time there. So yeah, I guess that's my transformation journey has really helped me kind of, uh, communicate on, on the podcast, you know? Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor at Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. For those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the carnivore market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products there will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, check it out using my discount code ANTHONY to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right. Thanks, yeah. guys. And, and when did you come to more sort of animal-based sort of uh, nutritional mindset? Yeah, that was about two years ago. So pretty much bang on two years ago. Uh, in fact, the book that was kind of the tipping point for me was uh, The Carnival Code by Dr. Paul Saladino. Mm-hmm. So I read that book. I was already on the fence anyway, because the thing was with me, Anthony, is I was getting gut issues. I was getting these skin issues as well, but it was mainly the gut that was, we all know, you know, if you look at things like gut and sleep, you know, they're, they're up there with the most important things really when it comes to your health. You know, true health does start in the gut. And it was really frustrating for me, Anthony, because I was in great shape. I was doing everything right. You know what I mean? But my gut health was just not consistent. You know what I mean? I was getting digestive issues. Um, you know, my stool just wasn't consistent and essentially still getting gut pain and stuff like that at times as well. Uh, not to mention my, you know, my girlfriend at the time, I just felt sorry for her with, you know, what was going on there with the, uh, just say how it is, putrid farts and stuff as well. So I knew something wasn't right. <laughs> I knew something wasn't right, but I was in denial. I was like, what is going on here? And anyway, cut a long story short, a good friend of mine who runs a really successful podcast here called The Health Sessions. Um, he actually used to own 180 Nutrition, Stuart Cook, jumped on his podcast and I saw him and I was like, what, what have you been doing? So he'd been following one of my workout, one of my training programs and he put on size all of a sudden. I said, what have you been doing, man? I know you've been following my training program, but what's your secret? And he was like, I fixed my gut. He said, um, he had, I think he had Paul Saladino on his podcast, which kind of planted the seeds. And he was like, oh, I just basically cut out these plants, which I think were irritating my gut and never looked back. And I was like, right, okay, now that's it. Now he said it, he recommended the book. And then, so yeah, two years, two years, just over. Nice. And what, what are some of the, the differences you've seen in that time? Oh, incredible in terms of gut health mainly. That's the biggest benefit for me is definitely just the gut health element. And it's it's funny how when you're really in tune with your health, and you'll know this better than anyone, you realize when your gut's off, I get more agitated. I just feel low. My mood's lower. And I'm just nowhere near at my best. I don't recover as well from training. Everything is just off when my gut's off. So when I started fixing that, that was just a weight off my shoulders. But also, it was just better mental clarity. It was more sustained energy as well because I was just having way less carbohydrates as well and just having more of a balance of you know proteins and fats and i keep going down the list you know libido was was good anyway but even that went up i noticed a difference there as well there was so many things but the big thing for me was definitely gut health and actually sleep as well sleep definitely improved because obviously i must have you know reduced quite a bit of inflammation there Mm -hmm. um and even muscle as well so i was already in fantastic shape but what i noticed as well is i retain muscle much easier you know, because the whole, the whole, this is actually in the midst of the whole lockdown thing. I actually stopped training as an experiment. I had equipment, but I thought, oh, I'm just going to stop training, going to focus on mobility. And I didn't, you know, I didn't lose any muscle or anything like that. And previously, I would have looked a bit different um, when I wasn't on, you know, when I wasn't eating mm-hmm. an animal based diet. So there's so many benefits, man. Yeah. I, I noticed that as well. Like even in the lockdown, I, you know, I was, I didn't have, I unfortunately didn't have like a home gym at that time. I had one in Seattle. I had the whole, awesome setup there. I, I built exactly what I wanted. And I was like using that for like, you know, like a year or two before I came down to Australia. And then as soon as you come down here, I was here for one year. And then 
bang, locked down. And I have, I'm just thinking of this amazing gym setup I have at home and I can't use it and all the gym equipment, uh, you know, I'm sure you, you saw as well. Like it just became you know, just thousands of dollars more expensive for just like basic equipment. And, 100%. Uh, that must've been brutal, man. That was like mental warfare. You can't get yeah. that release from the heavyweight. Yeah. You got a lovely gym over there. You can't get to it. Savage. So, so frustrating. And that's why they, I didn't work out. And, um, you know, I, but I was just eating, you know, how I would normally eat and just, uh, you know, to satiation and but i stayed very lean stayed very lean and very muscular i mean i lost a bit of size but i stayed you know very defined and uh, i probably went down to i think i think the lowest i got was about 93 kilos and which is pretty light for me you know i'm normally i'm normally uh around 105 to 110 and um and so that was pretty light for me, but I still look very muscular. And the people would always ask me, is like, how, how are you, how are you working out? Like there's no gyms, there's no gyms open. Do you have like a home gym or whatever? I mean, like I've, I've, I've done pushups twice. Like that's in three months, you know, like that's it. You know, and they're like, no, 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 you can't do that. Now you, you obviously you're working out all the time. I'm like, I'm, I'm not like, this is just, this is all diet. It's completely diet. But you know, to what you were saying, it was crazy that how easy it was to put on muscle after that. And I was, I was so just like, just biting, chomping at the bit. Like as soon as that gate opened and the gyms opened up again, like I was bang in there and I was I like, I'm going back to my old schedule. You know, I'm lifting at least four days a week. I'm going, you know, and and maybe even five or six, seven days a week, whatever I, I have time for, but at least four days a week, I'm not, I'm not compromising on that. And, and so I did, I didn't, I wasn't able to do like big three, four hour sessions as I you know had done in the past, but you know, I would, I would at least get, you know, an hour to an hour and a half in. And I just, without fail, I was just getting it done four days a week. And I ended up putting on, what was it, like 13 kilos in five weeks, you know, just lean, lean muscle mass, you know? So I went up to like, went from like 92, 93 kilos up to 105, you know, in just five weeks, you know, and, uh, and no supplements, no nothing. It was just meat and hard work. And, and when you look I, at red meat, though, isn't it? It's crazy. Like it makes sense because it's so complex. They're still figuring out all the compounds and all the tens of thousands mm -hmm. of compounds that you get in there, and that balance of amino acids and fats. Yeah. But not to mention the lack of inflammation as well. And obviously, your body responding so well because you had that novelty, right? As well. So when you mm -hmm. add all that compound effect of, and you, and you know you're a healthy guy, it makes sense, so man. You know, and, and like, no offense, but it's not like you're 21 either, mate. To pack on that much muscle, <laughs> sure how how, how high your test levels are, though. You know. Yeah, and you you know and that's the thing too. You know, I have I have um, I've spoken to people, well, I have patients that have had uh, that have dramatic improvements in their hormonal health and health in general. But you know, talking specifically about testosterone in men, people in their 60s and 70s increasing their testosterone by 30, 40 percent in three months by just going on a carnivore diet, and they feel better, and they look better, and they're performing better, and they're push, putting on muscle in their 70s. You know, which is crazy to think about but they yeah. but they can and they do uh one guy um that uh that i spoke to he's a he's a plays rugby on the u.s national team and he was telling me he's mostly you know he's meat based and he still has some you know some other things as well uh but the vast majority of what he eats is meat and and very little of everything else even just doing that he, he literally doubled his testosterone levels. He's like, this is crazy. And now he's like, he's just performing uh, at, a, at a whole new level. He was already on the national team. And now he's just killing it, uh, even as compared to himself. So it makes a huge, huge difference. Massive difference. Yeah. And it's funny you say that about performance because I do jujitsu now. Mm. And the way I eat, just for the audience anyway, I eat like animal based. So I, essentially, I just eat meat and some fruits. Some days I'll just won't eat any fruit. It'll just be, you know, meat, organ meat, <laughs> eggs, those kind of, well, that's pretty much it really in a nutshell. And then a few other bits and bars, bit of ghee oil, you know what I mean? Like beef tallow to cook my food in. Um, but on, in March, I just did for the first time ever. It was actually only in March. I did the first month where I had like just literally strict carnival, um, you know, nothing else other than meat, organ meat, and the foods I just said then and eggs. And I felt great. But the thing is with me is like, I just lose weight. So I was absolutely shredded. Like I probably could have got on stage. But the thing is, even with performance, I had this psychological barrier thinking, oh, you know, with jujitsu, you know, maybe I'll perform a bit better with carbs, but I just took them away and I was totally fine. I felt way better because I was the biggest benefit for me in March was my sleep. I, I track it using the aura ring and it was insane. The best my sleep's ever been. Nice. So there's something going on there. Yeah. And then last month I brought cars back in and stuff like that because I was just losing so much weight and I had a comp last weekend. 
Um, and I just didn't, I didn't feel as good. I know there's other factors going on there, um, but I just didn't, I haven't been able to get that quality of sleep consistently again since. So mm. now I'm like trying to figure out what I can do to kind of, you know, like drop yeah. back down without just, you know, looking so drawn. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> My girlfriend's like, you okay? You sure? Yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Honestly, it's just carnival. I'm fine. Yeah. Shred it. Look. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just ripped. Like, I don't know. Yeah, I'm just shred it. Take my shit off. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and, you know, that too, I mean, it is, it is easy to, to like under eat as well. And, um, and sometimes you can, you know, but I mean, but you, you can be just naturally someone that your genetics want you to be ultra lean. I mean, there are people out there that just like when they eat naturally, I mean, some of these guys, even when they're just eating like junk food, they're still like 3% body fat, you know? And, mm. um, you know, I think, uh, uh, Michael Vick was like that. I, I saw an interview with like his college roommate. Um, and this guy was just a specimen of an athlete and, and just, you know, uh, just a physical specimen in general. And he was saying that this guy was like, was just eating like McDonald's and junk food. And it was like steroids to him. He was just getting bigger and more jacked and more cut and more shredded. He's like, you know, what the hell was going on? And, uh, right. he was just, yeah, it was just, uh, you know, something crazy. So, you know, you probably have those genetics. Whereas when you're, you're, you're giving your body that your body just wants, wants a leaner shredded mm. structure. Like I yeah. get, if I'm working out, like if I'm, if I'm just like right now, I'll probably be 10, 12% body fat doing nothing, no exercise or anything like that. Just eating the way I am. When I start exercising, if I'm lifting weights regularly, uh, or even, you know, if I'm able to play rugby or something like that, that, that shreds down, leans down to like 6%, something like that. As, as I've checked with calipers and things like that. So mm. however accurate that is, but that's, that's sort of where my body wants to get to naturally. Whereas, you know, other people, you know, and so maybe if I wanted to get more shredded than that, more lean than that, I might have to tinker around with things a little more. Um, but you, you know, you sounds like you're just like naturally your body just wants you try 4% body fat without, without having to do anything at all. Can't complain. No, I'm, and that's a hundred percent right. And I know the answer as well. I know I'm just going to, I know in my head, like carnivore is the way forward. So I'm going to experiment now because I'm just getting back into strength training. I mean, I only had two weeks off. Obviously, strength training is my go-to, but um, because I had that jiu-jitsu comp, I was just doing jiu-jitsu. But yeah, just getting back into that now. I'm following a program, so I'm definitely going to do that. I'm going to eat pretty much carnivore. And then I'm going to just have some more fruit here and there now just to see how I feel. And then just to, to, to kind of compare the difference from day to day, you know what I mean? But I kind of know the answer that I'm going to just go straight carnivore. I know yeah. I know deep down that's the answer. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, I think, I think if you try it for a month, right. If you try it like 30 days, uh, yep. just, just strict carnivore that you'll, you'll yep. give yourself about it, your body, a chance to, to sort of really get the benefits of not having any carbs at all. Yep. Was, you know, professor, uh, Tim Noakes shows it, it can take, you know, a week or two or sometimes three weeks to get fully, uh, keto adapted to where you're, you're really humming on, you know, producing glucose, glycogen and ketones, and also your body's ability to utilize those energy sources optimally. And you have epigenetic effects that sort of have knock on effects so that after a while you, you're just really humming when you're on a ketogenic diet, you know, which, which, you know, just a meat and water diet is, um, you'll find that, you know, I, I would be willing to bet that you'll find just like, as I've found and, and I've found in other people that once you get to that stage, your energy levels are going to be way higher than, than even if you were eating carbs for workout and things like that. And you'll be able to consistently work out harder and harder and harder and longer and longer without any sort of, uh, you know, detrimental sort of energy effects. You just feel better and better as you go. And, um, I think that, you know, giving it that like 30 days, just so you, you know, that you're keto adapted, you're fat adapted. And so you can actually see like the full benefits of it and then maybe add in some fruit and see what it does that that would give you a, a good mm. uh, contrast. So you can you see what it's really doing to you. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that, well, that's what I did in March. I did the 30 days and then I brought yeah. the foods back in and stuff. And it, you know, it wasn't, I didn't really notice a drastic difference in any area. Really. I, I noticed everything was pretty much the same other than the most important thing, which is my sleep. So my mm. sleep hasn't quite been the same. So I don't know what's going on there. So obviously it must be some sort of inflammatory thing or something going on there. Mm. My body's like, no, no, you know, you're sleeping better, you're more, better rested, you're recovering better, you know, because everything levels up when you sleep better, right? Your whole yeah. life levels up. So yeah, I think you've just sold it to me again now. So I think now this month, I need to give that another crack now, do another 30 days. Yeah, And then, and then just next time, just kind of, yeah, tease things in a bit slower probably rather than just kind of, you know, that's the yeah. only thing with carbon, even like you sound silly, but even just having fruit, you start having more sugar and then it just becomes like a habit. It's like, mm. you know, I won't, you don't need it. You just want it. 
You know, it's yeah. simple as that. And then you trick yeah. yourself into, yeah, but I prefer. No, you don't, bro. You don't perform better. Yeah. Stop lying to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and you you can also do uh, thirty days and see how you feel, and just do another thirty days and another thirty yep. days, and then just you know just throw the fruit in the bin. And, yeah, uh, exactly. Go from there, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. So when you're when you're coaching people, are you doing? Um, well, walk us through the the type of coaching that you do. Is it, is it just for people doing bodybuilding, just trying to get their life on track in general? Uh, what sort of coaching do you do? So generally, yeah, it's it's, it's a combination of just general population. Mm -hmm. And, but a big chunk of my clients are kind of like ambitious people, you know, got a handful of really successful entrepreneurs or just like high performers in general, in terms of like, you know, in their professional life in the corporate world. So the kind of person that's already a, a quite a good level, essentially with their training and stuff. And they're just looking to get to the next level with their physique and with their habits and, you know, kind of dial in their behaviors and stuff like that with food and those kind of things and nutrition. So yeah, generally it's like a combination of general pop and those kind of people I talked about. Um, and how I, it's not bodybuilders. Um, how I help people then is obviously everything's personalized to the individual in terms of how we help them. But the first thing we look at, I find myself helping people more, uh, well, me and the team helping people more with the nutrition stuff. Because mm -hmm. as you know yourself, right, it's uh, it's actually being able to 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 change the behaviors and and dial things in and essentially just eat more whole foods. And you know, obviously, as you know, with the animal based stuff as well, I'm always kind of promoting them eat the most nutrient dense foods because a lot of people again are kind of. And this is another thing that I get as well, which I wanted to bring up is like that conflict that you get sometimes with clients in terms of pushback from their partners and stuff. Like they're eating pretty much animal based. Uh, carnival race. I don't like to go from one extreme to another though, Anthony, of course, because some people come to me and they're eating too much processed food. So mm -hmm. the, it's, it's obviously one step at a time. It's meeting them where they're at so they can make sustainable changes. But they start eating more meat. They start feeling better, looking better, performing better, all the stuff we've talked about. And then they'll get pushed back from their partner sometimes or someone close to them. Like, oh, you shouldn't be eating that much meat. It's bad for you, et cetera. So then I have to have a conversation with them. I have to show them research, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, which is interesting. And yeah, and also another client as well, he reversed his diabetes. He had two type mm -hmm. two diabetes. This has happened with a couple of clients, reversed it. And then he went to the doctors. Again, he's 50 years old in the shape of his life, abs, everything, right? Went to the doctor and the doctor said, you know, your cholesterol levels are quite high. Um, you should start eating plant-based, essentially. So then he came back to me and he was like, so yeah, it, that, that was another conversation. But yeah, so I really help people, um, you know, change behaviors, change mindset and help just general people get from, you know, being in either average shape or essentially being overweight. Some people come to me, they're overweight. Um, not obese, but overweight, and they really want to lose weight and, and learn how to keep it off because, you know, most people who come to me, they've tried several times. You know, people who want to lose weight, for example, um, they've tried so many times and, you know, over 85 to 90% of people gain all the weight back they lost at some point in their life or six out of seven people. So it's not actually weight loss. That's the issue is, is keeping the weight off. So a lot of people have tried many different things and they've failed to actually get sustainable results. So I'll teach them how to, to do it the right way instead of doing it the fast way when it comes to weight loss. That I, that's what I always say to people. Um, but it comes back, it comes down to the same fundamentals really when I'm helping people. It's always the key principles, really. It's not kind of rocket science. It's making sure they have an adequate protein, make sure they're eating predominantly whole foods, single ingredient foods, um, and then making sure they're training appropriately as well, training properly and training smart because a lot of people, they're just not, they're not training properly to maximize results because you know yourself, the stuff we talked about when you lift weights properly, you do strength training properly, not just doing a bunch of random workouts, like a proper program and combine that with good nutrition, good sleep, et cetera. Um, the results are absolutely insane because of what it does for developing your metabolism as well, which is uh, interesting because more research is coming out on this now, but yeah. So kind of went off on a bit of a tangent there, but uh, I get, I get passionate about this stuff. So no, it's great, man. Yeah. It's um, I always get, uh, I always have to like you know, shake my head a little when, when someone like your client comes in, in, in his fifties, you know, six pack, great shape. I, I bet you all of his blood markers and all of his uh, lab tests were perfect. And then the cholesterol is just a little bit, a little bit funny, according to that doctor. And instantly all the things that you've done that get all these objective benefits, stop doing it immediately. Obviously that's bad for you. Um, and because we've just been told that that meat's bad for you, you have to go plant-based, that's more healthy. But what did you just see? You just saw this person who was less healthy now become very healthy, uh, better shape physically, mentally, and on objective blood tests. And you're saying that the thing that he's doing is going to kill him based on what exactly? Based on just this theory that meat's bad for you and that plants are good for you? Well, you're, you're seeing the exact opposite. 
So it doesn't matter how brilliant your theory is and it doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. And so, you know, as, as we sort of said off, off uh, camera, you know, a theory is only as good as, as what it's able to predict. And, and the, his theory was that meat's going to make you sick. It's going to harm you in certain ways. And yet it didn't, it did the exact opposite. And it showed that in fact, your objective markers, objective markers were improved across the board. And so what does that mean? That means that theory is wrong. And so obviously <clears throat> not all doctors understand the, you know, the con with cholesterol. So I, I, I don't fault them for that. You know, it's just something that they need to need to learn and they need to be, they, they need to come across and, and be educated about, but you know, the rest of it is a bit ridiculous, you know, like all their, all their objective health markers have improved in every, in every other way. And physically they're doing a lot better. And yet you're telling them to stop doing the things that got them there. That makes no sense to me. It makes no sense. And I communicate it almost similar to what you said then, you know, if one marker is out, you know, one marker is not perfect, but all those other markers have improved. Right. And not to mention like metabolic health. It's like, you know, they didn't once have a chat to them about that or have a chat about at least the fact that you've lost a significant amount of body weight from your midsection, which is, as we were just talking about off air, around the mm -hmm. internal organs, which is essentially the worst place to carry visceral body fat. Yeah. And now you're 50 years old as well. You're in the shape of your life, better shape than you were in when you were 30 years old. He said that himself. And it's like, man, you've literally reversed, not to mention you've actually you know, reversed your, your type 2 diabetes in terms of all the blood markers there. And yeah, here we are having this, having this conversation, you know, it's... It's a tough yeah. one sometimes, man, you know? Yeah, well, absolutely. And 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 that's the thing. There's, you know, there's a saying in medicine that, you know, sometimes we forget is that you treat patients, not blood tests, right? So like look at the patient in front of you. They're healthy as hell and they're doing better on every, in, in every way you can imagine. And so you have this one aberrant blood test. It's like, is that is that really something you need to focus on? Maybe sometimes, but- you need to take it in the context of, of, of the actual patient that you're treating. And, you know, uh, you make a very good point about the metabolic health, <clears throat> because that is a much larger risk factor for heart disease and any sort of illness and, and, and heart disease in particular than, than even like small dense lipoproteins, like a small dense LDL uh, is, you know, and that's the damaged one. That's, that's only being damaged from carbohydrates, sugar, um, alcohol, potentially seed oils. And so, you know, that wouldn't exist. You just have the normal large buoyant LDL that are good for you, that you make that are important and necessary for life if you're not eating that sort of crap. And so there are a number of different studies and tests and studies for decades that, you know, and, and RCTs and things like that, that show that actually reducing LDL cholesterol actually make, can make things worse, or at least not improve anything. And even in, I think it was a pure study where they found uh, even a, a very small increased association. And again, association is not, you know, correlation does not beget causation, right? Um, but there are a lot of studies that show no correlation at all. And if you show no correlation, well, that means there's no causation, right? You have to have a correlation to have something cause something else. You have a very strong correlation. And so they had, even in those studies, there's a very, very weak correlation between overall high LDL and heart disease. And, and a lot of other studies showed no correlation, but then the small dense LDL that was like, so like LDL in general is like something like 1.3 times increased risk in that study. And then small dense LDL was like 1.7. Okay. But metabolic disease was six times more likely. If you had metabolic disease, you were six times more likely to get heart disease. And if you had type two diabetes, you were 10 times more likely to get heart disease and smoking was a similar amount. So, you know, why are we focusing on that? You should focus on your metabolic health, right? And the small dense LDL will go down as well when you get your, when you improve your metabolic health. So you get down to these, you know, maybe a 1.3 X, but you've got rid of 10 X, you've got rid of six X, you've got rid of 1.7 X. So how is that not an objective improvement? Right. And there's a ton of studies that show <clears throat> there's no correlation at all, even with just LDL in general. You know, there's a, there's a study with uh, 140, well, it's actually two studies with about 140,000 people in America who had heart attacks. And they looked at them and they found that half of them had high cholesterol, half of them had normal or low cholesterol, exactly dead even. There was no correlation one way or the other. It was just completely unrelated. Right. And what they found as well, one of the studies, they followed them up two years later. And of course, everyone was saying, you got to get your cholesterol down, got to get your cholesterol down. 
<clears throat> and so after two years, the people that had gone from higher cholesterol to low cholesterol or normal cholesterol or maintained low cholesterol were twice as likely to have died in that intervening, in, in that two year period. And so <clears throat> The, there was some sort of protect. It appears that there's some sort of a protective association with higher LDL cholesterol in that in that category. So you know this is not cut and dry. You know cholesterol is is bad and it's the worst thing ever. If it is something like small dense LDL, it has a stronger association with it. It's still not close to what metabolic disease is and type two diabetes is, smoking is, and uh, also you don't get you get this small dense LDL from having metabolic syn from the same things that give you metabolic syndrome and type two diabetes as well. So I think that, that, um, you know, doctors, you know, just forgetting that, or just not knowing that, I think, I mean, you're, you're, you're setting yourself up to give the wrong advice and to harm your patients. Mm. Makes, makes total sense, man. It's, it's, it's interesting how complicated it all is though, as well, isn't it? How simple it can be. And if you're someone like myself or Anthony, when you've kind of optimized your health, and you've really paid attention to all these things and you're in, you know, fantastic shape physically, but that's just the byproduct of how you live in and how you treat in your body. And it's really quite simple when you strip everything back. I think people get overwhelmed and, you know, conflicted because there's so much conflicting information online and everything else. And it really is quite simple. You know, if you, if you stay hydrated, if you eat predominantly real foods, if you're eating animal based or carnivore as well, you know, for most people that's going to work a treat, right? As we just said, it's, it's, it's actually impossible to, by the way, this was tried and tested because my girlfriend did it as well in March. She had strict carnivore and she was just like dropping weight, just getting leaner and leaner and leaner just as a side effect. She was trying to eat more and more. She was having like so many of these like grass fed, grass finished beef patties. She was loving it. She was loving the, enjoying the food, not getting bored, getting leaner and leaner and leaner, you know, non essentially. Mm -hmm. And she built muscle as well, actually. And she's been training for a long time. Uh, but all those things are just like a side effect of, of essentially you taking care of yourself, hydrating, getting good sleep and focusing on the things which are, they're not really sexy. You know what I mean? It's just like it's sticking to those fundamental things and, and essentially just being consistent you know, and, and integrating that into, into the way you live. Right. And, and just slowly implementing these habits and everything seems to level up. And when you start, and you mentioned as well as how you feel, right. You notice how you feel, your body will tell you, your body's very smart. You know, when you feel better, you notice you've got more sustained energy, you wake up feeling sharper in the mornings, you know, you're not getting as many cravings. Naturally, your body starts looking better when you look in the mirror, because that's just a reflection of your habits. Like I said, and it doesn't have to be so complicated. You know what I mean? It's like if people would just, and, and not to mention, as we talked talked about, you know, strength training should be the cornerstone of, of anyone's, of anyone's, you know, regime when it comes to getting in shape, strength training needs to be mm -hmm. number one, you know what I mean? And when it comes to heart health as well, obviously research shows now strength training is actually more beneficial for the heart than, than cardio, you know, as well. So we can go down the list with strength training, but they're the kind of fundamentals, right? It's not that complicated really, is it? <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, you know, to your point, like that was, that was something that I've spoken to with Dr. Sean O'Mara, who's sort of an mm -hmm. expert in visceral fat and and he was saying the best way to get rid of visceral fat which you know is is, is an actual driver for disease um is a uh, carnivore diet and uh you know uh strength training and like like high intensity training so like your know, weights and like sprints and things like that 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 just like melts that stuff away and you can actually have people that like run marathons and actually they're they're very skinny on the outside but they actually have more uh, uh, visceral fat. So call them tofi. So th thin on the outside, fat on the inside. Yeah. And so, like that. uh, and that's what some of these guys get. And so, you know, that sort of, um, you know, endurance training, uh, you know, that can actually do the opposite. You can raise your cortisol, you can suppress testosterone and growth hormone, and, and you can actually build visceral fat, which is a bit crazy. Whereas if you do high intensity training, where you just, you're just trying to kill yourself, that uh, that uh, seems to do the opposite, and um, mm. and can suppress cortisol and raise testosterone and growth hormone, uh, you know, within within reason, obviously, and uh, and get rid of that that visceral fat. Um, I was just going to ask as well, you know, how how have you found getting your clients onto like a more meat based diet? Like you said, you have to meet them where they are and sort of gradually bring them in. But you have a number of clients that are that are on a, a on just a straight meat based diet now. So yeah, I do have a few clients that pretty much, there's only a handful that eat like straight meat um, because again, because of the journey of kind of like implementation and making changes they can stick to. But mm -hmm. to be honest, I would say about, you know, 70, 80% of my clients are eating, you know, the majority of their food is coming from, from meat and animal-based foods, you know, probably about 80, 90% in mm -hmm. general, 70 to 80% probably. 
So yeah, the, the, the bulk of them are, are eating primarily, you know, primarily meat essentially, um, and, and getting great results really. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example though. I just want to give you an example on that. I had a woman come to me at the end of January and she had just actually already started eating carnivore for about two months and she'd had issues, um, Long story short, she took one. She made a mistake and took well, took one of the vaccines basically, and she had a, she had major issues and stuff like that, and obviously went into panic and stuff like that. And she went keto initially, and then she went carnivore for like two months. Then she found me on like a podcast or whatever. Anyway, long story short, mm -hmm. she's been eating you know pretty much strict carnivore for like ninety days. She just got to the ninetieth day now. She did have a bit of fruit here and there. But other than that, it was pretty much strict carnivore. And she, this is the interesting thing. People get so caught up with the number on the scales as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And basically her weight, she dropped two pounds in 90 days. That's all she dropped, two pounds. But she built so much muscle. We didn't track the exact amount of muscle she built, but it was just so significant in photos. But she went from she dropped three dress sizes, right? So she went from a size 10 to a size four. She dropped 30 inches in total of her body wow. within 90 days. 30 inches, right? And she wasn't like she was huge to start with. You know, she she was a bit overweight, but so anyway, it goes to show that, and that was pretty much carnivore. And the results were so much better and more significant with her because of that, because you already had that foundation, you know what I mean? With eating that way played such a big role. And we were just talking about packing on muscle and her, her number one goal, she's got, unfortunately, she's got like a disabled son with cerebral palsy. Her number one goal was to get strong enough to teach him how to walk again. He's like eight years old. Oh, yeah, man. And literally within the first month, we did like a strength training phase and she can now, she said he felt as light as a feather. He weighs over 50 pounds and his wheelchair weighs like 70 pounds. And she was like carrying, well, her and her partner were carrying the wheelchair and him into the into the van and stuff. She said with ease, he felt like a feather, you know, teaching him to walk again, all those kind of things. So that was, she had a real strong why. So obviously that, that like pushed her to get better results. But yeah, crazy, man. It just goes to show like with the body, how it works and metabolism. People always think, you know, I'm building muscle uh, or I've got to lose fat. I've got to do one of the the two. Now it does depend on where you're at and how much of a reservoir of fat you've got to lose. Uh, but in her case, obviously two pounds she dropped on the scales, but you know, dropped three dress sizes and built a significant amount of muscle. Um, so yeah, so it just goes to show that the clients that do really eat that way uh get way better results, you know what I mean? But I'm I'm still working on it. It's a work in progress in, in progress, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, you're doing God's work. And so thanks, man. <laughs> so everyone's going to be improving. Yeah. Well, oh, the way I did it, one more thing. So we did a 30 day whole food challenge in April. So that was kind of my subtle way of like, yeah, 30 day whole food challenge. All right, meat, let's go. <laughs> you yeah, know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so people were just, it was great. Last month was a fantastic month for that. It started converting them over. Mm -hmm. And they started realizing when they were having like meat, because I don't know why it's foreign to so many people to like not have meat for breakfast. You know what I mean? It's like, because we've been programmed. I do know why we've been programmed to eat cereals and white bread and stuff from a young age. But when they started having like meat for breakfast and just having, I said, look, have what you would normally have for dinner for breakfast and let me know how you feel. And bang, everything changes when you do something simple like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it does. Simple and, stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's amazing, amazing results that, that that woman's had and really wonderful that she can, you know, now help her son more and you know, maybe even give, you know, he's probably going to be eating similar things to what she's eating and, and probably benefiting from the, you know, I, I don't think that's going to reverse cerebral palsy, but it, it can at least optimize where he's at, which hopefully, hopefully it does. Um, that is something that, that I do see as well. Some people get very focused on the scale and they get worried that they're not losing weight. Um, but from the sounds of it, you, you've had patients with that as well, or clients with that as well. Um, uh, but what you're seeing is you're, you're a, a drastic change in body composition as opposed to just they're stalling on their weight loss. Is that right? It's a, it's a great question. I think this is really important to communicate to the audience. And this happens time and time again with clients. Like I said to you, especially people who come to me and they've been, well, Carissa is a good example, right? She came to me and she lost weight and gained it back so many times. And when she came to me, it's like, right, we're going to increase your calories. So a lot of people that come to me, we're slowly increasing. Instead of taking, my method for the most part is instead of taking away all the foods that are making you overreach straight away, what we're going to do is we're going to add in more meat, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to add in more red meat. Most people love eating red meat anyway. And a lot of people still, again, they're conflicted in terms of, you know, should I be eating this much red meat? And then obviously I come in and just tell them that actually it's fine. You know, quality does matter, et cetera. And they start adding in these foods and essentially just adding in foods, right? So instead of taking away, which is something that most people have struggled for a long time to restrict calories, so if you're going to take that same approach again, I mean, it's not going to work. It's like the definition of insanity, right? Like the, the Albert Einstein quote. So I come in, add more foods. And what happens is, um, and add, you know, certain fats that they get from meat as well. Sometimes, you know, the person might be eating a lot of processed foods. So I will, I'll swap those foods for like 
fruit like avocado, which is like 80% fat or whatever as well, which tends to keep them more satiated anyway. Um, and then what they'll do is they'll start actually simultaneously losing fat and building muscle. So like, let's just say on average, this doesn't happen forever. And it really depends on how much fat they've got to lose. But this is what happens for the average person is for about two to three months, they'll actually build muscle and lose fat simultaneously. So they might build a couple of pounds of muscle in a month if they're lucky and then drop a couple of pounds of fat or a pound or two of muscle. And, and they'll have that. It doesn't happen at the same time. Obviously you're either building or your body's, uh, you know, breaking down, breaking down tissue, but simultaneously they'll build fat and fat and lose muscle. And they notice with their clothes, they drop a couple of sizes in their clothes. And I've had some people, their weight goes up. So their weight's gone up mm-hmm. by probably about one, two, you know, one or two kilos, let's say in 90 days, but they've dropped like two to three sizes in their jeans or whatever. You know what I mean? So it, you know, it's not all about just that number on the scales. In fact, that can be a massive problem, which is why you've got to, you know, if you, if your goal is to improve the way your body looks, you've got to use other metrics, you know, body stats, you know, take photos, do measurements, those kind of things, you know? Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And I think, I think photos are a very powerful tool as well, because it's, sometimes it's hard to see what's happening to your own body. And then all of a sudden you see someone else, that you haven't seen in a while and go, Oh my God, you look great. You have, you lost weight sort of thing. Like, "Hmm, well, I I don't know. Did I, I I actually haven't, I haven't lost any weight, you know? And, but they, but obviously they're, they're making these big visual changes. Uh, I did that, you know, when I first got on this again, six years ago or so. And and that's what I did. I I took pictures sort of every month and I was just blown away at the difference. Uh, You know, each time I was just like, Jesus, like I was this, fat and gross and pudgy and like now i'm like lean and muscular and then like the next month i'm like i can't believe i thought that i was lean and muscular then i was gross like now i'm lean now i'm muscular and the next month i thought the same thing because it was like such a dramatic difference all the time but i stayed the same weight the whole time and you know i've never been you know focused on my weight i've never really cared about my weight you know, I've cared about my my fitness and my, my physique, my my ability to perform as an athlete. I've never really worried about how much I weighed, unless I was like not weighing enough. And I'm like, oh crap, I need to eat more, I need to work out more, whatever. Because I'm, I would lose, I, I could sometimes lose like 30, 40 pounds in a season because I was just training so hard. I just, I just couldn't keep muscle on, and I was like losing muscle mass because I wasn't able to, like you know, eat enough and all these sorts of things. So that was that was my problem, and. um, so I thankfully didn't didn't get concerned about that, but that is obviously a concern for so many people. Do you have people that are just like so focused on that number that it's hard to sort of basically relate to them that that they're actually getting objective changes, like amazing changes? Absolutely, yeah. A few clients, mainly female clients, I've had, you know I've just basically banned them from weighing themselves, <laughs> get the weighing scales out of sight, you know, put them in the loft or just chuck them away because. It's one metric out of so many things, and like you just said, then on your journey, you completely it's a you know re, re you know recomp right a body recomp. Your, your whole body composition has changed. Your weight stayed the same, but you look completely different. You've had a transformation, right? Mm-hmm. So you can actually it, your number. It's actually a good thing. Most of the time, it's actually a good thing. All of the time, actually, depending on where they're at, that their weight stays the same. So I know if their weight's dropping, if it dropped by a pound or two, it's cool. Um, or if it goes up by a pound or two, that's totally fine. But when it starts coming down, that means you're kind of going the wrong way. You're going the same way that you went before, right? You, you actually, metabolism is slowing down. We want to speed that metabolism up, you know? So yeah, to answer your question though, 100%, that can be a massive problem for some people just getting attached to that number on the scales. And I think that's a that's one of the ma- a big reason why people fail with sustainable weight loss as well, because they, they weigh themselves very often. And then, you know, their weight might go up one week or it might stay the same for two, three weeks. And by the way, like we just said, you can still lose fat and your weight not change much, and they get they get demotivated, disheartened, and then you know they turn to food, for example, to to make themselves feel better, and that's actually a common shown in research, you know, to be a common problem. But yeah, there's a handful of clients where I just ban them from weighing themselves. It's not allowed, and some clients, even with photos, man, even with photos, it's very infrequent. It's like not very often because you know certain people have like body image issues and stuff like that. So it's like all the stuff you fo- like if you focus on the other stuff, and that's always my message. I try and get my clients to focus on all the other metrics, like the strength, performance in the gym. We track everything diligently to make sure you know they're actually overloading their body, and we'll set targets with strength, whether that be squats, pull ups, whatever that could be, uh, or mobility or whatever. And then we'll just have them focus on you know getting good quality sleep, you know paying attention to like gut health and stuff, you know, and just paying attention to. How's your energy when you've eaten certain foods or, you know, and when you start connect, you have to connect the dots. There's no short way to do it. You know yourself. I know, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. You've got to connect the dots. You know, you've got to have that awareness and really focus on health and performance first. I think the body just, like I said earlier, that just is the byproduct really of, uh, of your, of your health, you know? 
Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I think that the main thing is is health, health and performance. Mm-hmm. Exactly, you know, especially if you're you're an athlete or you're trying to, you know, do you know get something done in the gym. But just how you feel and your at your your objective health markers, you're you, you're reversing. Uh, uh, you know, fatty liver disease, you're reversing diabetes, you're coming off medications, you stop having autoimmune issues. Uh, those are the main issues. You know, I mean, that that's what really matters. And you know, I don't have autoimmune issues. I don't have any major illnesses, but I just felt so much better doing this that I, I knew that object, I, I knew conceptually that this was, this was the right thing to do just from our biology. And then when I tried it, I was like, I've never felt this good in my entire life except for those five years that I was doing this in my early twenties. And so, you know, I didn't, I didn't worry about anything else because I just felt amazing. And my, you know, I did see objective improvements, you know, in my physique as well and my performance. And that, that was all I really cared about. I just, I didn't even care about how I look. I cared about, you know, being able to play rugby and feeling great all the time. That that's what was important to me. And I think that's, and that's what I try to relay to other people as well, that you can get caught up on the scale. You can get caught up on all these other, you know, more superficial markers that may not actually be an indicator of your health and and your improvements and, and get sidetracked and then not, you know, see the full benefits of this long-term. And so, yeah, I, I totally agree that focusing on air health and performance is, is absolutely uh, number one of importance. Definitely, definitely. And those behaviors, like I talked about before, right, when I used to overeat on the weekends and everything else, you know, and the all or nothing mentality is is a common thing for most people. And when you can overcome that and you can kind of get to a point where you don't feel restricted. And that's another good thing as well about, you know, the kind of or animal base, wherever you want to call it, you know, it's you just don't feel restricted. You know what I mean? Because it's almost like your body's telling you, right, we're getting the nourishment that we need. And we're not hungry, you know, and it just, I, I am always wary around people who don't like eating beef. I don't know about you. It's, <laughs> I'm wary. I'm like, <laughs> no offense to anyone, but I'm like, beef never gets boring. You know what I'm saying? No. Never. No. It almost feels like, either. how can I eat? Like, it's almost like, how can I, I mean, we're fortunate enough to be able to afford it and everything else, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. It's almost like, wow, is that, how can this be happening? I'm eating these foods. And I'm looking like this. I'm enjoying these foods as well thoroughly. It's like it's a win-win, you know. Yeah, hundred percent. And I, I, I've never, I've never not enjoyed a steak. And you know, people say it's like, oh, don't you get bored of that? And I was just like, well, first of all, you know, does, does cow does a cow get sick of grass? Does it get bored of grass? Does the <laughs> lion get sick of gazelle? And so it's like, oh my god, like you know, gazelle again? You know, can we not just have like a you know. <laughs> Like a, okay. like a, you know, fresh country, you know, fresh salad or something like, like, no, they, that's what they want every time. And, you know, because that's, that's what they're hungry for. And then it tastes better when you're hungry. And so if you're not hungry, yeah, it's not going to taste good. So don't eat, but we're so used to eating all the time. We're, we're conditioned to eat multiple times a day and they're, oh, now you eat three times a day. Oh, now you have to eat six times a day. Now you have to eat, and, you know, all these, no, absolutely not. And, you know, I don't think that those are helpful to anyone anyway but those, those recommendations and, and you have to wonder who's paying for them, you know, because there's a lot of lobbying efforts to affect the, these guidelines. And, um, and that's why people that, that say like, Oh, you should always follow the guideline. There was this guy, I swear to God. Um, I saw him on YouTube or, or sorry, on, on Instagram, someone mentioned him. Um, he is somehow a doctor and he, was saying that, you know, we're talking about like different, uh, you know, doctors talking about how you can, you know, reverse diabetes and, and you know, really improve your metabolic health and all these sorts of things with uh, like a ketogenic diet, which is clinically proven, you know, that, that's a fact. And, uh, and you're saying, well, this goes against the guidelines. Whenever you see someone go against the guidelines and against the consensus recommendations, like, you know, that they're just completely wrong. Like, um, what, you know, I mean, the consensus was the earth was flat at one point. You know, so it's just like, what, what the hell are you talking about? And the, and the guidelines change every five years. Right. So, the, but it's, but it's, it's just, that's, the, that is the, the God's honest truth every time, but it changes every time. So each time it's 100% correct or, or are things being influenced by different factors, but also by new and available evidence coming out, new studies coming out, showing that clinically you can reverse type two diabetes by putting someone on a ketogenic diet which you can, it has been clinically proven. And so this guy was saying that in the hierarchy of evidence, it goes consensus statements, guidelines, 
and then randomized control trials and meta-analyses of like, are you out of your mind? You know, like the, the opinions of people is better than objective evidence. And uh, I'm sorry, no, that's that's not how that works. And um, apparently this guy doesn't know how guidelines are set up. You know, it's set up by bureaucrats who who vote. You know, it's not by the scientists. It's not by the top doctors and researchers who may have their own biases. Um, they Those doctors and scientists submit their recommendations based on the science and, and submit different studies to support their their viewpoint. And then the bureaucrats go behind a closed door and, you know, are influenced in certain ways or not. And then they come up and say, these are the guidelines. It's not actually done by, by the scientific community. It's done by bureaucrats. And so if you follow guideline medicine, you are following bureaucrats. You are not following scientific uh, knowledge and research. You're not following the recommendations of the top doctors and researchers. You're following bureaucrats who may or may not have influences, uh, you know, from the different industries that, they are supposed to be protecting us from. So I think that you always follow the evidence, not, not the guidelines. And if you, if you have to, I mean, even evidence-based medicine, I heard one doctor say, if you follow evidence-based medicine, you'll always be two years behind the cutting edge, right? Because evidence-based medicine is something that has been published, takes years to put out a study and get this published and put this out. So this is, this is work that someone's done years ago. That was the cutting edge. And now it's been published several years later. So if you want to be on the cutting edge, finding the best thing that you can do for people, you know, you need to sort of go off track for a little bit. The guidelines are there for a reason. They're there as a guideline to keep you sort of like, Hey, if you don't, if you don't know any better, this, this should, you know, at least keep you on track and not do anything major blunders. But if you have better information, you have more, you know, even evidence-based medicine, you know, you should, you should use that. And so if you're, if you're practicing evidence-based medicine, you're going to be two years behind the cutting edge, but if you're practicing guideline med, uh, medicine, you're 15 years behind the cutting edge. You're probably, probably 10 or 15 years behind the evidence-based medicine, in fact, because it can take, it can take a long time to just get the actual evidence into the guidelines because it's a bureaucratic process. Mm. And, you know, with you, it's worth questioning everything anyway, right? Yeah. Especially when it comes to this stuff. Because you look at the current state of affairs, we're fatter and sicker than we've ever been, right, as humans. And, and it's only getting worse and worse, you know what I mean? And you look at, like, the processed foods and you look at where people are at. And, you know, I just see it in behaviors with all the people I've coached. And even myself, like I said, you know, with the processed foods, you know, I was the Domino's and Ben and Jerry's guy, you know, on the weekend and just overeat. You know, those foods, most foods that you see which come out of a packet, they're designed to make us overeat. You know, they're designed to make us overeat. So it's like, it's not like those foods directly, you know, are going to make you, no, those foods make you overeat. They're not going to make, they only make you gain weight because they, they're designed not for health, a lot of those foods to make you overeat. And I think it's worth questioning things when you look at, you know, where we're at on obesity and people being overweight, it's, it's just getting worse and worse. You know what I mean? So you've got to kind of read in between the lines and it does some, sometimes requires just a little bit of critical thinking and just to take a step back and go, okay. And just when you look at people who are in shape as well, I think it's, it's quite, don't get me wrong, there's some people who are in shape who you don't want to listen to, don't get me wrong, that can be a problem as well. But at least when it's someone like, you know, you or me, when we're actually in shape, it's like, at least just go, oh, okay, so what they're doing is doing something, you know what I'm saying? Because these guys have been eating this way, living this way for X amount of time. Uh, they're performing well, they feel well, you know, they look good. So, and, and they've actually, they actually know what they're talking about or whatever. It's like, yeah, you got to just read in between the lines sometimes, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. And um, yeah, you're right. I mean, there's some people that, that, you know, are in good shape and probably didn't get there their best way and, yeah. you know, or even, even they're in good shape and they're doing things that, that are objectively better than the average person, but the average person is pretty sick and the average person is, is, you know, 70% of Americans are either overweight or obese. And that's not even the highest number. I think we're like 20th uh, in that, you know, so there, there are other places that are worse and everyone else is close behind and something like 90, 91% of Americans have at least one metabolic issue, meta one metabolic disease. So that's that's not a great marker. Like, oh, well, I'm 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 in the mix. I'm average. No, obviously you don't want that. Whatever we're doing on average uh in Western society, actually around the world and non-Western cultures as well, they're they're actually plagued with this, uh, sometimes even more than Western countries. And that because they're getting infiltrated with these processed foods and sugars and things like that. And, you know, when I was in Bangladesh, I was in refugee camps there and there were packets of, of, uh, you know, potato chips and gummy bears and things like that. It's the middle of the jungle. Right. 
And they were like, just, just like candy, like just bad good. And that's what people were eating, you know, dirt poor. Most people didn't even have shoes. And, and yet they were buying these like, you know, fun size bags of Ruffles potato chips, you know, nothing against Ruffles, but that's, that's just the brand that I saw more often. And uh, they didn't have any garbage disposal. They didn't have any waste disposal, um, you know, or anything like that. So they, they would just throw this plastic on the side of the, of the, of the street. And uh, they'd sweep it up into a big pile and burn it. And it'd just be this black plastic smoke coming off of it. And, you know, you're in the middle of the jungle and these guys are still eating junk food, you know, and uh, they probably can't afford real food and they're, and they're spending their money, what they have on this junk food. So even like, you know, the diabetes rates and metabolic syndrome in, uh, you know, India and, and uh, you know, very impoverished areas around the world, you know, they're, they're going up. There's some of the, some of the, the, um, you know, metabolic issues and, and metabolic diseases are actually some of the most prevalent in these in these areas. So it's a huge, huge problem around the world. And so some people can be just by doing whole foods, not even meat based. I mean, there's people who do plant based, and uh, it's it's better than that, you know. And so you know, you have to sort of look at that and go, yes, okay, that's that's much okay. Well, this person looks like he's in good shape. That's great. But then, you know, there's you and I saying, well, meat-based is the best. There's other people saying, well, plant-based is the best. And they might be in, in good shape too. And they might like be, you know, trim and fit and, and feel good as well. It's in, it's, in, it's always compared to what? As compared to a standard processed diet. But then you have a lot of people that are plant-based and then go meat-based, whole food. And they get even more improvements. So you talk to so many people that they're just like, they they just come alive and they have so much more energy and more uh you know, they just have better health and like all these different, you know, brain fog and all these other sorts of things just sort of go away. So, you know, even, even then just looking at someone saying, well, well, this person looks like they're in shape, but are they, are they as healthy as they could be? You know, they're healthier than other people, but are they as healthy as they could be? And I think that's where you have to sort of get into the, into the weeds a bit on, on what's best for humans. Mm, definitely. And it just comes down to what I always talk about is single ingredient foods, right? Mm. Like you just said then beef, eggs, and mm. avocado, berries, banana, as you say, those, if you go, if you're eating processed foods, they're designed to make you overeat. So if it's got a long ingredient list on it, like most of those foods have, which are just designed to be highly palatable, mm. and they're literally engineered to make us eat the shit out of them, essentially, right? That's the way they've been engineered. Um, single ingredient foods, basically, you know, it's uh, very hard to overeat when you're having single ingredient foods, you know? Yeah. There's actually, there's actually a study done where they found that 500 calories more a day, essentially, they did this study on two groups and it was like a cross study. So they crossed the group over to make sure there wasn't too much variance from, mm -hmm. from each person. And what they found is on average, they over ate by like 508 calories a day when they had unlimited access to processed foods versus unlimited access to single ingredient foods. They over ate by like, it was exactly 508 calories a day. Do you realize what that adds up to? It's like, you know, three and a half thousand calories a week. It's like give or take around about a pound of fat a week or something like that. You would gain, you know what I mean? So if you look at that long-term, even over the space of a year, and I think the average person does gain like five or six pounds a year or something like that. So it kind of makes sense. Then there's research on that now, you know? So <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, pretty, yeah. it's pretty straightforward, isn't it? When you talk about it, but it's yeah. like, like we always said, the, the behaviors, what, those foods are kind of like, they, they are essentially addictive. You know, that's the bottom line. They are actually designed to get you hooked on them. Right. So yeah. Yeah. It's almost unfair. It's almost like not fair when you talk about it. It's like, how? How yeah. is that happening? Yeah. Well, and, and when it comes down to it, I mean, these foods didn't exist. They didn't exist 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. Some didn't even exist, even exist last year, right? So, you know, if we're, if we're going to talk about optimal, you know, how are you going to say that or, and what, we're, what we're biologically designed to eat? Like all animals, we have, we have we're biologically designed to eat something. So whatever that is, you know, I would argue that it's just me, but it is something we are biologically designed to eat something. And so whatever we're designed to eat, it certainly wasn't something that didn't exist last year, right? Because it didn't exist, right? So, you know, the dawn of humanity, that's what we were eating. That's what was something that was optimal for us. And so if something didn't exist back then, obviously it's not something that we're designed for plain and simple. hundred percent. Makes total sense. Absolutely. Well, great. Well, Martin, thank you so much uh, for coming on. How do people get a hold of you? What? How do you? Uh, is it is an online coaching business, or how do people get in touch with you and and uh, and and uh, seek seek out your services? Yeah, yeah. So the best way to find me, I guess, is going to be on Instagram. So at Martin Silver Fitness. Uh, Silver is S I L V A. So Martin Silver Fitness. 
And yeah, you can reach out to me. There's like a link in my bio on there where I've got, you know, my email address as well on there. But the best way is, I guess, just to drop me a DM on Instagram is probably the best way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And yeah, like I said, my email address is on there. The coaching inquiry form is on, on my the link in my bio on Instagram as well. And yeah, just my podcast as well. I'd, I'd urge people to check out the podcast. I've had some great guests on there. There's some great content on there. Um, Optimize Your Body. That's uh, available on all platforms, really. And yeah, I guess that's kind of the best the best place to find me, I would say, is just uh, head over to Instagram. I'm also on TikTok now, you know what I mean? I don't know about you, mate, but I've just, I just uh, bit the bullet and got on there and I'm like, uh, uh, really? Oh, cool. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's horrific, man. It's a cesspool yeah. at Martin Silver Fitness. Anyway, if you really want to see what I'm about, you really want to see me dancing with purple hair on, I'm not really oh, joking. Dude. It's not like yeah. <laughs> no, it's bad. You know, I mean, there are people on there. And so like, I, yeah, I, I sort of post like little reels and, and clips and things like that. Same thing. But um, I always feel dirty for having done it. Yeah. <laughs> It's like the processed food of social media, isn't it? <laughs> TikTok. Yeah, exactly. Is exactly right. It's just like the worst of the worst. We just degenerated so far, and it's just like, and there it is. It's just like the perfect storm of 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 um, decadence. You know, it's just like 100%. you just don't need it. Yeah, hundred percent. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Well, I'll put all that, uh, all links for that in the description where people can find that. And, uh, and yeah, I encourage people to check it out. You know, he's got his, uh, he's got a great Instagram page. He's got a lot of, uh, you know, before and after uh, pictures of the different sorts of clients that he's had and, you know, showing amazing results as well. And so you can, you can see in real, you know, in, in real world examples, uh, just how beneficial this is for people. And so, yeah, so I encourage everyone to, to go down there and check it out. Uh, Martin, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure and, uh, hopefully we can do it again sometime. Thanks for having me on Anthony, mate. Really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks. Hey guys, thank you very much for taking the time out to listen to what I had to say. If you like it, then please like, and subscribe to my YouTube channel and podcast. And if you're on YouTube, then please hit that little bell and subscribe. And that'll let you know anytime I have a new video out, which should be every week, if not more. And if you could share this with your friends, that would help me get the word out and let me know that you like what I'm doing. Thanks again, guys. Mm -hmm.